So a question I've been getting a lot lately in the comments is, how did I get into this? Specifically, food history. I'm, I'm not a chef or a professional cook, I'm not a historian, so kind of a weird topic for a YouTube channel. Well, it all started with the Great British Bake Off, specifically the fantastic history segments that they used to have with the old hosts Mel and Sue. Mel, Sue, I miss you so much, please let's have lunch. My favorite episodes were always the episodes where they would make some dish from history, and then Mel and Sue would go uh, discuss the history, and it always kind of, it was like it brought a bit of history into the tent. And I decided that I wanted to recreate some of the historic dishes that they were doing because while I don't really have anything in common with a medieval king or a Victorian social climber, if I made something that they would have tasted and then tasted it myself, it, I felt like it would create this kind of imaginary line through history so I could feel a little bit of what they felt. Unfortunately, before watching The Great British Bake Off, I didn't know squat about cooking. I didn't even know that you were supposed to add salt when heating up the water to boil pasta. So I had a bit of a learning curve, but I decided to teach myself how to bake, mainly through the wonderful masterclasses that Mary Berry taught. Anyway, the episode that really got me uh, geared up to, to learn how to bake was an episode where they mentioned a certain medieval cookbook, and I cannot find it. Probably it's, you know, not available here in the United States, and at some point I watched it when I was either over there or took it off the internet. Anyway, the book that they mentioned is this, The Form of Curry, England's first cookbook. It's a collection of recipes from around the year 1390, compiled of the chef meister cooks of King Richard II, King of England after the conquest. So today, after you hit that like button, we are going to dive into the wonder that is The Form of Curry and make one of its quintessential sauces, Galantine this time on Tasting History. So the sauce that we're making today, Galantine, appears several times in the form of curry, and each time the recipe is a little different. There are actually two recipes specifically for its use on pork, and neither of which is the same. So the recipe I'm going to use today is for kind of the base sauce, which could then be modified uh, for use with beef or fish or chicken or pork or a lamprey if you've got that laying around, really whatever you want. So in modern English, the recipe reads, Galantine, take crusts of bread and grind them small. Do there too powder of galangal, of cinnamon, ginger, and salt. Mix it with vinegar and pass it through a strainer and serve it forth. Now, I don't know a ton about sauces, but they usually have some sort of liquid in there, which, other than vinegar, this doesn't actually mention any liquid. Um, and it's going to be kind of astringent if the only liquid in the sauce is vinegar. But whenever the sauce is mentioned elsewhere in the form of curry, it usually is made with either wine or the blood or juices of whatever meat it's going to go on. So we're going to add those in. So the meat that I'm going to use for this is pork shoulder, but you can use anything, uh, but you do want something that's going to give off quite a bit of juice to help you make the sauce. So what you're going to need is a cup of liquid. First, get as much juice as you can, and then top it off with wine. Red, white, doesn't matter. Then about two pieces of stale bread. You could also toast it, but if you're cooking something in the oven, the best way to make it kind of stale and dry real quick is just leave the bread out on top of the oven while you're cooking, and it'll be good to go by the time you're ready to make the sauce. This is my cat, by the way. Cersei, say hi. She's been in a mood. She just got a little brother and she ain't thrilled. So the next ingredient is a little hard to find, so I'll put a link in the description to where you can find it online, and that is Gollingal, or Gollingale. And that is actually where the sauce gets its name. So we want to use a liberal amount, so I'm taking one piece and grinding it up, which makes about one and a half teaspoons. It's definitely worth getting because one, it smells wonderful, and two, we're going to be using it in some upcoming recipes. Then one fourth teaspoon of cinnamon and one fourth teaspoon of ginger. So for all of the spices, I used heaping quarter teaspoons and heaping teaspoons uh, because we really want to showcase the spices flavor and we will get into why in a little bit. Then some red or white wine vinegar to taste. I used about two and a half tablespoons just to give you an idea. And then some salt, again, to taste. So first, take your bread and crumble it up as fine as you can. Then whisk together the crumbs, the galangal, the cinnamon, and the ginger. 
Then in a saucepan over a low flame, heat your drippings in the wine if you ended up using any. Then add in the breadcrumb and spice mixture and whisk together. Then add in the vinegar and a little bit of salt and let it simmer for a few minutes, about five minutes just to reduce down. Now while that simmers, let us take a look at where this lovely little recipe came from, the form of curry. So the 14th century is kind of a renaissance for cooking, or at least writing down recipes. Because between the fall of the Western Roman Empire and the year 1300, we don't know that much about what was being eaten by Europeans. We have some information, but no detail, no real recipes. Then in the 14th century, we have hundreds and hundreds of recipes with surprising detail coming at us from the kitchens of European royalty. The bulk of the recipes come from just three manuscripts. The first was the French Le Viandier du Tevant, followed by the Italian and written in Latin Liber de Cochina, or Book of Cookery. Finally, near the end of the 14th century, we have from England the Form of Curry, or the Method of Cooking. Now the title The Form of Curry didn't really become a thing until the 18th century, when Samuel Pegg compiled all the recipes into one book. Before that, they were just manuscripts that didn't completely match each other exactly. But the most famous, and probably the oldest, is a six meter long vellum scroll kept at the British Library with 196 recipes on it. It bugs me that they didn't add four more to just make it an even 200 recipes, but maybe they ran out of room on the scroll, I don't know. Now we don't know the names of any of the master chefs who created these recipes, but we do know that they would have sat in the center of a massive kitchen wherever King Richard happened to be, because he was itinerant, he was always moving around from castle to castle. And they would have sat there barking orders to an army of between two and three hundred cooks as they scalded, boiled, plucked, deboned, roasted, baked, and sauced dishes for hundreds if not thousands of guests of the king. All the while, a scribe would have been scribbling down whatever the master chef told him to put down, all of the recipes and whatever the king liked and didn't like. Compile all those recipes and you have the form of curry, which is why the recipes don't always match. They were probably made by several different master chefs and several different scribes over the period of about a decade. Anyway, it's really fitting that England's first cookbook be made by the chefs of Richard II, because say what you want about dear King Richie, and there is plenty to say, but he was an infamous gastronome. Food and feasting were always a big part of any court culture in medieval times, but King Richard II took it to a whole new level. Some historians actually credit him with kind of making that turn from the raucous medieval feasts of the Normans and the early Plantagenet kings into the more refined occasions that you'd associate with later kings, like the Tudors. He made sure that everyone washed their hands before the feast began, and he introduced the handkerchief to dab your mouth of food instead of wiping it on your sleeve, like I do. He also popularized the use of spoons. It's said that every member of the royal household carried one on them at all times. And many of the manners that we still adhere to today, like no belching at dinner, no elbows on the table, and not talking with your mouth full, were strictly adhered to at King Richard's court. Now a medieval feast, whether it was Richard's or anyone else's, was not just about food. It was about politics. It was a way to show off your wealth to everyone around you often by showcasing a vast array of dishes, and the form of curry has a vast array of dishes. While it has plenty of recipes for pork and beef and chicken, just as popular then as they are today, it also showcases dozens of different species of fish and fowl and other sea life, and really focuses on game, which could only be hunted by the king and his courtiers. Then there are recipes for things like whale and porpoise, which would have been available only to the wealthiest of diners. It also eschews commoner ingredients like butter and replaces it with precious olive oil, which would have had to come all the way from near the Mediterranean, or a fine refined white lard called white grease. Sounds pretty fancy. Now as impressive as porpoise and white grease might have been, the best way to show your wealth in medieval England was with spices, and the form of curry is absolutely riddled with them. Cinnamon, mace, clove, galangal, long pepper, ginger, cubebs, grains of paradise, spikenard, caraway, the list goes on. And they weren't just used for their flavor, but for their color as well. 
Many recipes are tinted red with sandalwood or gold with precious saffron. There are almost no recipes that don't showcase spices, and usually it's two or three at least. In a few weeks we're going to make Hippocras, which is a spiced wine from the form of curry, which uses no less than nine spices. Very expensive drink I've actually had to take out a second mortgage just to make it. And based on the notes from the royal spiceries, these spices were used in copious amounts, a lot more than we'd typically use today, especially in Western cooking. The dishes were probably more akin to the highly spiced foods of modern India, which makes sense. That's how you were going to show your wealth. A little ground pepper ain't going to impress nobody. Now, the chefs also created their own secret spice mixtures, probably similar to the Colonel's 11 Herbs and Spices. The most notable in the form of curry were Powder 4 and Powder Deuce. And while these would have varied from chef to chef, most historians think that Powder 4 had a ginger or a pepper base, and Powder Deuce had a sugar base. And that is the ingredient that really makes the form of curry stand out when compared to the other 14th century manuscripts. While the French Viandier mentions sugar eight or nine times, it is present in a third of the recipes in the form of curry. And not just in what you would think of as desserts, because the concept of desserts being sweet and entrees being savory, that hadn't really been developed. In fact, the whole idea of dessert was just in its infancy then. And so sugar is treated like any other spice. You were just as likely to find sugar in a tart as you were rubbed into a roast goose. And that's why most medieval sauces read more like American barbecue than a French Bernays sauce. But by the smell of our galantine, I don't think it's going to taste anything like either of them. So let's check on it. So once your sauce has reduced down to the thickness that you want, give it a taste and tweak the salt and the vinegar if you need to, then pass the sauce through a strainer just to make sure you get rid of any gall and gall bark. So here we are. It smells really nice. Very like, kind of perfumey. Um, with a little bit of citrusy in there maybe. Let's give it a shot. Mmm. First of all, I did that pork amazingly. Just throwing that out there. That's wonderful. That's really, really nice. Such an interesting flavor and in the best way possible. Interesting because I, I was worried that it was gonna have a eucalyptus flavor because the, the Galingal kind of, kind of has a eucalyptus camphor scent, but it doesn't. It's, it's there, but it's so mild. Um, it's more of like these kind of citrusy notes coming through and then the cinnamon uh, playing off of that. Really, really nice. And I could see this being used on absolutely anything. Chicken, fish, pork, beef, doesn't matter. Even just like vegetables. It's just a really nice sauce. I'd say be careful on, on the vinegar because it could easily tip over into vinegary. Um, really, really good. Now, if you want to see more recipes from the form of curry, I've made a playlist, I think right down here, uh, with all of the form of curry recipes that I've done here on Tasting History. So make sure to hit that like button, and I will see you next time on Tasting History.